<laughs> Beep boop. All right. Welcome, everybody. This is our lecture that accompanies Chapter 15, Lesson 5 in our book. We're going to take a look today at some of the written laws that affect civil rights in the United States. There are many more than the ones that are covered here and covered in our textbook, but we're going to take a look at some of the hits and talk a little bit about the function of some of these laws and why it is that law tends to be a little bit more effective than a court case even if court cases do have the full impact of law. Then we're going to take a look at some of the art of history dealing with case law and school desegregation. A lot of times we, uh, our history textbooks do us a disservice by identifying this as, okay, there was separate but equal, and then Brown versus Board of Education fixed that. We're going to take a look at the cases since Brown versus Board of Education and see that, as I uh, said in the term just a little bit ago, there's a bit of an arc to the history here of desegregation, but the growing problem of resegregation in American schools is something that we'll take a little bit of a look at at the end of this lecture today. So I want to start off with some of the largest laws that deal with civil rights in the United States. And as our textbook points out, there is nothing larger than the Civil Rights Act itself. Civil Rights Act in 1964 is the single most comprehensive law in the United States dealing with protections on the basis of not just race, even though that's what it's commonly associated with, but the phrase from the Civil Rights Act, which we have there in uh, quotes, is race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. So civil rights law and the Civil Rights Act is important not just to uh, law for race or color as uh, it, we usually associate it with, but is also important to gender, is also important to immigration status. There are many different parts to the Civil Rights Act, but the two that are probably most worth uh, calling out and mentioning Title II of the Civil Rights Act is the one that makes it so that any sort of public facility, and when we're talking public here, we're not talking public as in government owned, we are talking about a facility that is generally open to the public. Movie theaters, restaurants, hotels, etc., cetera, um, must be desegregated. This, uh, the Civil Rights Act officially outlawed the idea of a hotel segregating on the basis of race. Title VII is the part of it that outlaws any sort of discrimination in employment. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, like obviously a small family business that is two people and employing their uh, child does not need to hold open interviews on the with, to make sure that they have uh, all races uh, included. But for any employer that hires more than 15 workers, they may not discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Going back to last lecture, which uh, in which we talked a little bit about the classification system, you might remember that with strict scrutiny, it is then not only uh, that one cannot discriminate, but if one's policies are, if a business's policies are challenged on the basis of uh, discrimination, it is up to that business to then prove that they have the burden of proof to demonstrate their employment processes are processes are non-discriminatory. This kind of goes back to what we started talking about at the very beginning of uh, civil uh, at the very beginning of um, the court system when we talked about the Abercrombie case and how the Abercrombie company had to prove not just oh no, uh, our policy is okay, but that had to prove that they did not discriminate on the basis of religion when not hiring Samantha Eloff. The Civil Rights Act is massive in its effect, although a uh, couple things to note about the timing of the Civil Rights Act. 
The Civil Rights Act comes in 1964, so that is a full quick math here. 96 years after the 14th Amendment said that all people would be entitled to equal opportunity under the laws or equal protection under the laws. It's a little bit odd that the amendment that would ultimately be justified to outlaw the segregation in public schools it's not until 1964 that we see a law on the books that really starts to uh, enforce that. This goes back to a conversation that uh, Mr. Lekovich and I had earlier this year that was a very weird one. And I, we spent a couple of weeks talking about this and researching this, but we the idea is effectively okay, the 13th Amendment outlawed slavery. When did there become laws or penalties for slavery in the United States? When did that get enforced on the books? And at first I thought, well, this is silly. The 13th Amendment and the Civil War uh, says no more slavery. But then I looked at this and the 14th Amendment says equal protection, but then it took us 96 years to actually start to put into law how equal protection occurs. Similarly, it, the uh, 15th Amendment said, nope, voting rights cannot be denied on the basis of race, but it's not until 1965 that the federal government actually starts to, with the Voting Rights Act, put into place, here are the penalties if you start, if a state or a locality denies people the right to vote on, their, on the basis of their race, and here is the process for monitoring that. Amendments are great for those broad promises and for determining how courts will view issues. Amendments are great for outlining here are the principles that uh, govern uh, the United States. And court cases are great for clarifying what the spirit of the Constitution is. But really and truly, uh, private action and or individuals' actions doesn't tend to change unless there are laws associated with it. Which brings me to another law that seems like a weird one with the 14th Amendment already being on the books, which is Title IX of the Education Amendments. The granddaddy, I, grand, grand mommy, Grand, grand, grand mammy of them all uh, when it comes to women's rights in education. Title IX is often associated with one thing, and the thing that it is very commonly associated with is women's sports in high school and college. And there's a good reason for that. One of the most visible, in fact, the most visible outcome of Title IX is that for every sports opportunity that a school provides to men, that school must be also providing equal opportunities to learn from sports and to grow through sports to women. So the expansion of uh, women's sports to being co-equal with men's sports is a direct result of Title IX and stems out of the 1970s. Uh, and sports are also an easy place to understand uh, the outcome of Title IX and a little bit of how Title IX is different than just straight up, uh, you cannot discriminate on the basis of gender in education. Uh, sports are still sex segregated for the most part. Um, sports can be uh, sex segregated and sports can be different on the basis of sex. If a school has a baseball team and a softball team, they have fulfilled their Title IX obligation. They have provided two equal opportunities. Title IX allows for separate but equal, which obviously is permissible on the basis of gender and sex, but is not permissible on the basis of race. Uh, you can't have like, hey, there's the Asian baseball team. Uh, no, that's, that, that is not allowed. Um, but, uh, yeah, sorry, I got off on that. The mental image threw me off there. We'll edit this out of the video later, except probably not. 
But Title IX is not just uh, discri- is not just sports. The phrasing in Title IX is that students cannot be denied access to educational opportunities on the basis of sex. This includes a lot of things, and this is pretty uh, broad language. Um, one of the most important clarifying cases in Title IX is actually a sexual uh, harassment, sexual sexual harassment, sexual abuse case. A student was being abused by their uh, school on the basis. Of, uh, a female student was being abused at school. Full stop. Um, and she later made the case that this denied her equal access to education on the basis of her sex. Not only did she win in court that she had been denied access to certain educational opportunities because of this, but what the court ruled was that Title IX could, violations of Title IX could result in that school district being sued, being fined. And that's really where we get the teeth that come with Title IX. If school districts need to not discriminate on the basis of sex or provide equal opportunities for everybody regardless of sex and can be fined otherwise, then we're going to see school districts actually do it. So once again, while the 14th Amendment promises equal opportunity under the laws to everybody and has been on the books since 1868, it's not until 1992 that there is a clear or else what. What are the ramifications going to be for this? I think we also briefly talked in the last slides about uh, the VMI case. Uh, the VMI case is another clear understanding of Title IX. Yes, segregation can occur in educational facilities on the basis of gender but not if there is not an equal opportunity available for both genders. Talking a little bit about the difference of the effect of amendments and law, a topic that has become more interesting since our textbook brought it up, and our textbook is a very modern textbook, um, but one that's become more interesting this year is the Equal Rights Amendment. As your textbook mentions, every uh, session of Congress for since time immemorial, Congress has introduced and attempted to pass uh, an Equal Rights Amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment actually did pass through Congress in the 1970s, but failed to get the uh, requisite number of states to ratify it to become a part of the Constitution. What an Equal Rights Amendment would say is that flat out discrimination on uh, the basis of sex is illegal in the United States. Not just uh, equal protection under the laws for women, but it is illegal to discriminate on the basis of sex, so for women, for, for men, um, in the United States. This is not a part of the Constitution, although we've talked about all of the ways in which there are protections on the basis of sex and there are legal protections and constitutional protections written in, but this type of broad language does not currently exist in the Constitution, but worth notifying that the state of Virginia finally uh, ratified the Equal Rights Amendment earlier this year, which now means that enough states have ratified the Equal Rights Amendment that if it that uh, it could uh, or have at some point in history ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, that theoretically, if they all were to do it at the same time and in the right order, the Equal Rights Amendment could be added to the Constitution. It'll be interesting to see in uh, let's say let's say in 2020 when a new uh, session of or I'm sorry in 2021 when a new session of Congress meets if that Congress would pass an Equal Rights Amendment, uh, because now it's clear that there are uh, enough states that would be interested in passing it, and if the states would ratify it, I don't know, it's, it is not impossible that we will have a 28th Amendment added to the Constitution within the next decade and have it be the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, just so we give some sort of uh, discussion to other forms of discrimination because sex and race are the places that obviously get the most ink in textbooks, 
I think that uh, another good example is disabilities in uh, dis disability discrimination. And our text does point out the existence of the ADA and the IDEA, uh, both of which dealing with rights for individuals with disabilities, both of which uh, passed in 1990, although both of them are also updates of previous laws. It's not in 1990 that we had first had law to uh, defend individuals with disabilities. But what's worth noting about these laws is, once again, my overall point, the 14th Amendment says that all people have equal protection under the laws, uh, but that requires the clarification uh, within written law and within law passed by Congress eventually to uh, include, oh, and by the way, equal protection means that you can actually get into a school. Equal protection under the laws means that you can actually get into a public facility. Equal protection means wheelchair ramps. Equal protection means sign language interpreters. We oftentimes, the story of civil rights and uh, the defense of rights is told through court cases because those are really the landmark time, landmark moments where we see uh, governments uh, issue rulings in favor of uh, civil rights protections. But a lot of the meat really comes when there is a law associated with it. I would also then say that oftentimes we look at we do ourselves a disservice when we look at a court case as being the end of a story. When we look at, oh, and then the court ruled that this was unconstitutional, and that's done. Um, and one of the major places where we can do ourselves that disservice is in looking at school segregation in the United States and saying, okay, Brown versus Board of Education said we will not uh, segregate schools anymore, and that was the end of school desegregation in 1954. I want to talk a little bit about the cases post uh, Brown versus Board of Education and try to paint a picture here of some of the issues with uh, school desegregation that still persist in the United States. After all, in Brown versus Board of Education itself, one year after the landmark decision that said Plessy versus Ferguson is overturned, separate is, or separate is inherently unequal, one year after that, the Supreme Court was forced to do something that it almost never has to do, which is issue a second ruling on a case, which was pretty much the equivalent of the Supreme Court a year later saying, uh, guys, did, did you hear us? We, we said desegregation um, and said, no, seriously, schools need to desegregate. And then the phrase that's used is, with all deliberate speed, if schools need to desegregate at the, pace, at the quickest pace that they reasonably can. This led to decades and, yeah, this led to multiple decades of schools, especially in the American South, trying to uh, refuse the, the uh, order to desegregate or trying to come up with the least that they could do for desegregation. And there's a couple of cases that go with that that I think are important, and they're included in most textbooks. Uh, one that's not included in ours that I think is important is the 1968 case of Green versus New Kent County, uh, New Kent County in Virginia. The uh, case here was that New Kent County said, all right, we used to have a white school and a non-white school. Now we just have two different schools. We still have the kids set to go to the same schools, but you know, if you want to voluntarily cross the line, and if you want to voluntarily desegregate yourselves, go ahead and do it. This is not a integration policy. This is the absence of an integration policy. And what happened in New Kent County and what was ongoing was obviously people were sticking to these same schools because a white student wasn't going to want to go to the traditionally non-white school given that they were 
always of inferior quality, and a student who went, traditionally went to the non-white school uh, or a non-white student was going to have significant social barriers and significant uh, costs to trying to go to the white school without the effect of the government redistricting or drawing re or forcibly integrating that school. Locally, and the case that is most commonly brought up with this is the 1971 landmark case of Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. Uh, invariably, I always have students in my classes whose parents, if you're if your parents grew up in Charlotte in the 1970s or even after the 1970s, your parents were probably affected by this. Uh, the ruling in 1971 was that Charlotte could, as a way of making their schools integrate, take people or take students beyond traditional school district lines, bus them for a good distance to create integrated schools. Why is such a thing necessary? Well, because segregation doesn't just affect public facilities. Given the long history of segregation in the United States, segregation affects our neighborhoods as well. Given that one of the major ways in which school districts tend to be drawn is on the basis of neighborhoods, well, if you were to just draw a geographical map for schools, you would still have very segregated schools in a lot of places. The result here was that Charlotte's schools still were segregated, even though they weren't legally segregated, they were still segregated because they were only drawn from their local neighborhoods. In order to integrate, the court ruled that Charlotte could be, uh, or Charlotte could force for students to be bused outside of their school district so that they created actual integrated diverse schools rather than uh, it's technically desegregated, but still de facto segregated schools. I would point towards Swan versus Sharmek as also being the peak of when of cases and American case law dealing with uh, desegregation by actively trying to integrate public schools. And while I'm referring to it as the peak, I'm not just saying this is the uh, largest effort that the courts made, but that after that, courts started to back off of the mandate that schools be integrated. Three years later, the same kind of case happened in Detroit. Detroit was getting ready to bus its students across traditional borders, and the Detroit school district, in the case of Milliken versus Bradley, uh, the Detroit school district was sued on the basis of, well, wait a second, you're just going to move kids across, uh, across borders? We don't even know that these schools were segregated in the first place. We don't know if they were actively segregated. They were just segregated on the basis of their community. In what's kind of a partial reversal of Swan versus Sharmek, in the Milliken versus Bradley case, the uh, court said, okay, we'll only allow for kids to be bused across uh, traditional uh, geographical boundaries if you can prove that the reason why those boundaries were drawn that way was to segregate the schools. Well, now there is a burden of proof on anyone who is challenging school districts, and there is a massive shield for anyone who wants to say, look, the school districts are just drawn that way because of how it, it's just the neighborhoods, bro. Uh, it is that the only reason why the school looks like that is because of where people happen to live. Furthermore, and one that I've the article that from which the graphs I'm about to share with you says is really the uh, point that started to reverse a lot of desegregation efforts in American schools is the 1991 case of Oklahoma City versus Dow. And in this, Oklahoma City was effectively saying, look, 
we had we were told to desegregate our schools we made an effort to integrate our schools we showed that we made an effort to integrate now we don't want the federal government checking up on us all the time and it was ruled that once states show that they have done something about a court order to desegregate that they don't need to constantly prove that they are addressing this issue let's see what happened shall we if we take a look at a graph This here is the percentage of black students in the United States who go to a, or who at the time went to a school that would be considered integrated. That is diverse in its background. It is not predominantly black unless that area is predominantly black or unless that geographical region is predominantly black. And you can see a couple of important things on this chart. Thing the first that we see is that the uh, even after Brown versus Board of Education, there was not a substantial uptick in schools actually being integrated until the Civil Rights Act, when there would be actual laws, actual penalties for schools not being integrated. Then, over the course of case law, things like busing, as Swan versus Sharmak, we see that schools increasingly become integrated. And since the 1990s, schools have become less integrated in the United States than they once were. In fact, if we were to take a look at this chart, American schools right now are about as segregated as they were in 1968. And that's astonishing to me, the idea that uh, black students are just as likely now as they were in 1968 to be in a school that is not integrated, in a school that is, for the most part, a non-white school, a school that is, for the most part, a black school or a predominantly minority school, even though the area is not predominantly minority. And the reason why this is significantly important is evidence shows that having students go to an integrated school directly impacts their future success. You can see this chart here where the x-axis is how long that school had been uh, desegregated. And when you look at the zero point there, you see that what happens is once a school gets desegregated, and this is looking at data going back to the 1955 Brown versus Board orders, uh, once a school gets desegregated, well, adult poverty for all students who attend that school goes down, wages as future uh, employer employees, uh, or in future, future wage earners, I guess, whether that's employed or self-employed or entrepreneurial or whatever, uh, wages increase drastically. Integration is good for students. Integration is good for schools. Uh, it leads to better results down the road for all students. And yet we see, uh, going back to the previous one, integration is something that has ceased with our schools and our schools have started to resegregate themselves. The last chart to look at, what your typical student sees on the basis of their race in the schools that they go to. And this is based off of 2010 data. We might see this data changed a little bit with uh, 2020 census data, and I'll be interested to see what we find out with the same kind of census data, or with the having the same sort of data 10 years later to see if this trend still exists. But you might notice here, your average white student in the United States goes to schools that are 75% white. Your average black student goes to schools that are only 25% white and are about 48% black. Your average Latino student in the United States goes to a school that is majority Latino. Um, Asians, Asians are always uh, forced to be with other people. <laughs>
there are other other groups. Um, there is there are very few areas in the United States that are predominantly Asian. Uh, but the these charts are always eye popping to me. The idea that your average student in the United States, even in an era post Brown versus Board, pro, post busing, et cetera, even in an era where we think of segregation as being an issue of the past, your average student is in a school where most of the students look like them. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I might actually share this article, the article that is associated with this on, on campus if you want to take a look at it. It's a very thought provoking one, but we're almost out of time for today. So I will stop the recording. Oh, that was just stopping presenting. Oh boy, I'm gonna look like a big klutz in this recording. I will stop the recording.